So yeah, so this week what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up Aristotle. And that's going to take a lot longer than I thought. I was looking at my PowerPoint. We're probably going to skip a few things that I have on my PowerPoint. But uh, we're going to try to get through as much of that as we can before our break. You know, so we'll do that for about, you know, 90 minutes or so, not quite. And uh, I just realized I realized I don't have my phone, so I have no way to keep time when I'm sharing the screen. So somebody might help me today if I'm going over and it's getting close to like 1.30. Uh, you might chime in and interrupt me or something because uh, I normally use my phone and it's in the other room. And yeah, I don't really need it. It's just a distraction. But uh, so we'll do we'll do that. We'll go, we'll go over Aristotle for about 90 minutes. Hopefully that we'll get it done with him. Um, and then we can come back and get started on Hume. We're not going to do very much of Hume, but I just want to kind of introduce you to David Hume and, and, and a little bit of where his it's a, it's a fairly short article compared to some of the other readings we'll be doing. Um, but we want to you know introduce you to Hume. And then I guess for next week, um, what we'll do is we'll, um, we're going to wrap up Hume. The first, the first half will be wrapping up David Hume, and then we'll talk about Kant a little bit. Kant is probably, I mean, I hesitate to say he's the most difficult, but he, he might be the most difficult reading in this class. So, um, you know, do as much of that as you can for next week, you know, finish David Hume, finish that. That's the priority. Get your paper in by Wednesday. Uh, and then focus on reading the David Hume article. Uh, and then if you can, maybe get cracking on, on, on Immanuel Kant, because it's not going to be easy stuff. Um, so that's the game plan, okay? So let's, let's go ahead and get started. I've got, you know, some, some uh, comments here in the chat. Okay, greatest professor ever. I like it. All right. Oh, no arguments there. All right, let's see. Let me uh, go ahead and get back to uh, where we left off last time. So um, we ended class last time. We were, um, we finally got, I guess, the, the, geez, I, okay, now, now I see. I don't know what the deal is here, but Zoom is really, um, it's really glitchy lately. So it takes a while for, for my, my face to pop up or whatever when I share the screen or whatever. Okay, so anyway, last time we ended class, sort of the punchline, we finally got to kind of the essence, you might say, of Aristotle's philosophy of art. And the idea is that art has an aim. You know, Aristotle likes to understand everything in terms of aims. He's a teleologist. Remember we talked about teleology, the Greek word telos, uh, meaning aim, goal, uh, purpose, end, function. All of these will be fine translations of that word. So teleology, you know, studying the aims and the means to get to those aims or ends. Um, and so he tends to think everything this way. He talked about nature this way. The, the plant aims to become, you know, the seed aims to become a plant. The human embryo aims to become a human being, and not just a human being, but a happy, fully developed human being. And these aims are natural. So he would, he would obviously, he's going to apply this to art. Art is going to have an aim. Today, we're going to focus on tragedy, really. That's going to be the more or less the focus of a lecture. There's going to be some tertiary uh, um, concerns that are going to pop up, but it's mainly about his, his view on tragedy. This, by the way, is about all we really have that has survived of Aristotle's on art. Uh, you know, he wrote extensively on art and, and, and rhetoric, etc. But we only have fragments that survive. We only have fragments of his whole corpus, really. So we're kind of going off all this to understand his overall theory. So sort of, I guess, take it with a grain of salt. I, I, we can kind of say with confidence that, you know, judging by what we do have, uh, he's going he's gonna to approach art, whether it's tragedy or comedy, he's going to approach it in this teleological sense. So the aim of tragedy in this case is to, uh, it, it's to arouse pity and fear. This is the quote that we ended on. And in order to accomplish catharsis of such emotions, uh, we talked about catharsis at the end of class last time. So that's the aim, not just of tragedy, but of art in general, emotional catharsis. Can someone help me out here to tell me what is uh, catharsis and why is it good? Why is that a good aim? We, we went over this last time, but I'm just kind of reviewing. I think it's like the release of emotions in good. a sense. And it's good because you have it bottled up and that's just not good for you. 
Right, you're all tense and, and you know, you've got all this, these emotions bottled up. And then when you release them, um, it allows your, uh, your rational part of your soul to take over. And so you, you're, you're, yeah, somebody says release of tension, pretty much similar answer. Uh, and that's good because the, emotion, the emotional aspect of your soul is calmed and the rational part can focus on truth and be unbiased and do good philosophy. So, you know, and that's, a high, that's the highest aim of the human intellect uh, for Aristotle. So tragedy aims for this, right? It wants us to, you know, you, you want you want to cry, you want to feel bad, you want you want to get all those emotions like that are pent up out. Um. Okay, so let me go ahead. And I'm going to start this slide. Where are we at? Okay. You know what? Let me let me go back to that. I've got like five or six people here in the waiting room, so hold on a second. My apologies. Okay. Here we go. Rock and roll. Okay, so this this is the quote we left on. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip it. Okay, you can reread it if you need to. Uh, you know, you don't don't forget all these these uh, PDF files are available on the uh, uh, the Blackboard site. So this this uh, this is where he uh, he sort of starts by, I guess, dissecting things. Yeah, you know, he was also a biologist. He liked to dissect all various animals to figure out, you know, how they worked and all the different organs and all the functions, the telos of all of them and how they all, you know, they were all aiming for a higher purpose, okay? There was this, this sort of systematic connection between all of them. So, likewise, he does this with tragedy, okay? He sort of chops it up into parts. We've got six parts, apparently, uh, that comprise tragedy. The first is the spectacle, uh, that's sort of the stage itself, the set, uh, the actors and how they're dressed and all the costumes. Uh, then there's melody, uh, diction and thought. Okay. So, so these, you know, these are basically forms of language and, or I guess melody is music also, right? We sing a melody, but melody could be a, a, a musical accompaniment. But when we're talking about tragedy here. He's probably talking about the chorus, which was always sung character we'll get into that in a little bit um he he explains a little bit more about what it means by character and then there's the actual plot itself which he seems to think is the most important part like this is the, the, the highest and most important element all the other elements are subordinate to it we talked about that a bit last week how uh when we're making a work of art or anything that's created by art a tech you know techne by technical craft um all the things that are that come together to make that thing are subservient to the per, to the aim, and so plot takes the high road here. It takes the sort of the high it's it's the high the highest most important part of tragedy. So therefore, all the other elements you could say for Aristotle are subservient to it. We talked last time about means, manner, and objects of imitative art. So. Uh, you know, you can review that if you want to look uh, look at the last last week's video. I don't want to go over it too much because we still have so much to cover. Um, but when when it, when it when it comes to to tragedy, the manner would be the spectacle, right? So how how is it performed? It's performed with actors on a stage. The means, well, with melody. There's a certain melody to it. A diction. The the words are arranged in a certain order. Thoughts are presented. Again, there'll be more on that later. It's not quite clear what he means by thought or character. He's going to elaborate about. So those are the objects. Those are what the, that's what the that's what the uh, the play is trying to present, uh, and also the plot itself. But remember, uh, even though the last three are all objects, so they're all sort of like technically in the same category for him. Um, plot is still more important than character or thought. Again, more on that later. So, um, okay, yeah, more on it now, actually. Thought and character is the next slide. Uh, let's read the quote here and see how he explains it. Some of these quotes are pretty vague, so I need to maybe throw in some examples to help us uh, along here. But let's just jump in and, and let's read what he writes and see what we can make of this. The subject represented is also an action, and the action involves agents. So when we're watching a play, a tragedy in this case, it's, there's actions, things are going on, activities, people are acting between, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's different groups, different factions, or just different individuals, different interests, they do things. Um, 
some of the stuff he says just seems pretty freaking obvious, but you gotta remember he's one of the first people to write theory about art, uh, you know, him, and, and, and really, I mean, you could argue Plato writes about art. We did a whole section on Plato's philosophy of art, but you could argue that for, for, what, for all we know, uh, Aristotle is one of the first to write about it in a super systematic way. So some of this stuff just seems sort of common sense and obvious what he says. A lot of his philosophy is this way. Um, okay, so yeah, we're, we're watching something that has events in it, actions, and it involves agents, people doing things. And they must necessarily have distinctive qualities. So these characters, these agents, have to have character and thought. Okay, so what, what does he mean by these? It's from these that we ascribe certain qualities to their actions. So it's by character and thought that their actions make sense. There, the, uh, there are in the natural order of things, therefore, two causes, thought and character of their actions, and consequently of their success or failure in their lives. Okay, so when we look at their actions, we can only understand them in terms of these two things. And now he gives us a definition of character and thought. Uh, the first one, and you know, you, you, when you hear it, like, okay, that seems okay, I get what he means. But then when he gets the second one, it's kind of like, well, what's the difference? Or how do I know? Let's just read it and see if, if, if maybe, maybe somebody else can jump in and explain it better than me, uh, but I'll give it a crack. Character, according to Aristotle, is what makes us ascribe certain moral qualities to the agent. So, so if we think of somebody who's greedy uh, and we see him staring at um, a pile of money, we're imagining that this is a greedy person, so he's probably thinking about how he can get that pile of money if it's not already his own, or he's lusting after it, or whatever. Um, so that character makes us ascribe certain quality, moral qualities, as, as Aristotle puts it to the character. Thought, however, distinguished from character, is shown in all the agents say when proving a particular point, or as it may be, enunciating a general truth. So this, I suppose, is more evident in dialogue, I would, I would guess. I'm trying to think of an example of this. Maybe when somebody's in a play, trying to persuade one of the other characters that something is true. This will re reveal sort of their inner thoughts, what they really believe. So I, I, to me, I would think that thought is a part of character. So I don't really know why Aristotle wants to distinguish them so much. If anybody has any ideas, I'm all ears. Um, so the fable or the plot, this, this element of, of tragedy, again, for Aristotle, super important. He says the action, that which was done uh, is represented in the play by the fable or the plot. So the fable or plot for Aristotle is, like you might think, it's a combination of the incidents or the things that are done in the story. And here we have this sort of chart of a, your, 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 your typical plot line. You've got sort of the exposition, the beginning, the opening, we're introduced to all the characters, and then things start to get interesting and we start to see further development. And then there's some really crazy thing that happens in the middle and then there's resolution and you know, the end, the credits roll. Okay? So that's the typical uh, plot sort of shape, I guess. The line. So the more, most important, here it comes, or I told you, I told you it was coming. The most important of the six is the combination of incidents in the story, right? The plot, like the fable. Tragedy is essentially an imitation, not of persons, but of action and life, of happiness and misery. Okay, so when we're watching a play, it's not so important who's in it, like whether or not there was really a guy named Oedipus, if you're familiar with Oedipus, Greek tragedy. Um, whether or not there really was an Oedipus the king is not really important. What the play is telling us is about life, about action. It's an imitation of, of action and life, of happiness and misery, of these emotions. All human happiness and, or misery takes the form of action. The end for which we live is a certain kind of activity, not a quality. This ties a bit into his ethics. Um, you know, for him, happiness is an activity. We, t we moderns tend to think of happiness as a, as a state of being. I am happy. I feel happy. You know, I'm just, it's, it's a quality I just have. But Aristotle defines happiness as an activity of the soul, 
uh, in accordance with complete virtue or complete excellence. So uh, he thinks that all goals for humans are actions. What do we aim? We want a career. Well, like, what's a career? It's doing things. You know, that would be an example. Maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want a family. But that's that's doing something, raising a family. You want to be a novelist or an artist. You, that's that's it's an activity. All we aim for action. Okay. So character gives us qualities, but it is in our actions what we do that we are happy or the reverse right there it is ties back into to his ethics if you're familiar with that in a play sorry uh, uh yeah, yeah sorry in a play according accordingly they do not act in order to portray the characters they include the characters for the sake of action so so again the characters are subservient to plot they're in the play to i make the plot interesting to to push the plot forward to its its natural resolution. So it is, it is the action in it. In other words, it's fable or plot that is the end and purpose of the tragedy. And the end is everywhere the chief thing. The end, the telos. Remember Mr. Aristotle here, the teleological thinker. So tragedies, he says, can work without character but not without plot, right? Even bad writing, I guess he thinks can work if the plot is good. Um, and why do I have these two films pictured here? I'm, maybe some of you are familiar with La Dolce Vita. I'm guessing that probably everybody in here is uh, familiar with the Avengers Infinity War. And I suppose if you really wanted to um, be nice to me, you would allow me to call both of these tragedies. That, that these movies are tragedies. Um, La Dolce Vita, maybe that's more of a stretch. Um, Infinity War is certainly a tragedy, right? Don't they don't have doesn't half the world die at the end or half the universe dies at the end? Okay, they lose. Okay, sorry to spoil it for you. you haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, but you could argue that Infinity War doesn't have a lot of character development. You know, it's just like a bunch of action. I mean, it's, I, I like it. I think it's a fun movie to watch, but it definitely doesn't have like, you know, but it's got a fun, it's a fun movie. It's got an interesting plot. You know, it's, it's not definitely not a boring film, um, but I suppose it's tragic. And so I guess Aristotle would say, yeah, see, that worked. But he would say, but I, thought, I would say La Dolce Vita kind of works, although it has no plot. It is, I'm curious, has anybody in here, are you familiar with La Dolce Vita? You can type it in the chat box or just chime in. Well, just trust me, it has no plot. There's no plot. I mean, the plot is basically, there's this lonely newspaper reporter uh, in Rome, and it's just sort of his lonely, sad life. And it's like, he's like hanging out with celebrities one night and then hanging out with his dad one afternoon. And it ends, it ends, he goes to some mansion out in the countryside in Italy on the beach, uh, on, you know, on the shoreline. And the, the movie ends, they're all hung over after this big party at the soiree and they pull up this weird dead sea creature on, 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 on the beach in the morning. And that's just how the film ends. And there's no plot. It's just a day in the life of this sad, man. <laughs> like it's the, the tragedy of modern existence, you know, I suppose. Uh, maybe I'm stretching the definition of tragedy with La Dolce Vita, but it certainly has good character development. There's a lot of characters in the film. Um, you get to learn about the man himself. I forgot the name of the character. Um, but a lot of the people that you meet are very interesting and, and, and you kind of get, it's very psychological, uh, but no plot, no plot. Um, although I, I probably, I have to admit, most of the class would probably fall asleep halfway through La Dolce Vita, where I think everybody here would probably have fun watching the Infinity War. So I digress. Um, again, but my main point is, and his main point, and the one trying to drive home here, is that for him, plot is the most important part. Characters are subservient to it. Everything actually is subservient to it. So all the other elements, like spectacle, uh, the diction, all that other stuff, which we'll get to uh, in just a moment. Yeah, the spectacle here. He says the spectacle, although it is an attraction, is the least artistic of all the parts. I'm sure if anybody here has designed stage props, they take offense to this quote. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the spectacle is the least artistic and has least to do with the art of poetry, of creating, bringing forth, oasis. The tragic effect is quite possible without a public performance and actors. And besides, the getting up is more a matter of the costumer than the poet. 
So this is all window dressing. You be, maybe maybe he's being a bit harsh, uh, and maybe also his theory is a bit informed by you know the type of tragedies, the type of plays that he was seeing back then. I have a, a still image here from an opera by Philip Glass called Waiting for the Barbarians and the set designs by uh, George Tipson there. I, I, they did this in Austin when I was living in Austin about 10 years, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, it was amazing. And the set itself was really a part of the plot. Um, th there were, I think, 12 or 13 uh, different layers of these screens that would go by. And, and as they moved, it would move along the story itself. So, you know, I don't know, maybe I could say that might be an exception where the spectacle is a part of the plot, but for him, it's just window dressing. He's thinking of the story of Oedipus, which we'll get to in a minute. I'll, I guess, I'm assuming a lot of you have heard the story of Oedipus, but just in case, I'll, I'll give you a very quick <laughs> version uh, in a minute. But if you hear the story of Oedipus and you've never heard it before, It'll it'll make you go, ugh, it, wow, ugh, yeah, that's that's awful. Uh, yeah, it's a tragedy. You don't really have to even have a good writer. You don't even have to have a good storyteller. As long as you just tell the story, just straight up, uh, the plot itself, uh, it's enough to arouse that, you know, that tragic effect that Aristotle thinks is so essential and so important. You know, but for him, the the way it's presented, you might have a, an amazing set designer who comes up with this great presentation of Sophocles, uh, Oedipus the King, uh, but it's still, uh, for Aristotle, not essential. I mean, it's nice, maybe, but he might even argue, I would think, it's detracting. Remember, he aims for the middle, the moderate, and if you're just, if the spectacle is too amazing, it'll, it'll distract you from the work itself, from the story itself, and and therefore it'll be less effective at, at arousing these emotions, and you'll have the catharsis that is so necessary for him. Okay, so here's where he gets quite formulaic. Um, surprise, you know, you probably aren't surprised by this. So he says that um, a tragedy is an imitation of an action that is complete in itself a whole of some magnitude has to be miserable okay so it has to be whole we'll get to why that is in a second that seems like kind of a redundant point why is he even mentioning it but we'll see why it's significant in a minute uh so a tragedy is an imitation of an action that's complete in itself a whole of some magnitude uh for a whole may be of no magnitude to speak of now a whole is that which has a beginning a middle and an end so he thinks that all tragedies have to have this structure a beginning middle end um a beginning he says is that which is not necessarily after anything else and which has naturally something else after it an end is that which is necessarily after something else either as its necessary or usual consequent and with nothing after it and the middle is that which is by nature after one thing and also has another after it. A well-constructed -construct plot, therefore, cannot either begin or end at any point that one likes, beginning and end in it must be of the forms just described, okay? So um, I'm guessing somebody in this class of 40 or so have seen the movie Pulp Fiction. Um, what do you think Aristotle would say about that film, given this quote here? Good, bad, it's not really a tragedy, I guess. I guess you could argue it is, but. How is the plot? Has no one ever seen this movie? I, I'm sure, uh, yeah, plot is too divided. Great movie though. Yeah, he would say that. Does it begin in the beginning of the story? It begins in the end. Like the, the first scene is the end. Like it's like it, it ends, like it begins at the ending basically. And then, and then it, it jumps all over the place. You know, you, you, you go from one scene to the other, and it's, it's not linear at all. Uh, Tarantino, he, he's probably not the first to do this, but he's usually given credit for it. He's the first to popularize it, for sure. 
Um, and in fact, this is a common thing you see in TV shows a lot. I, I know when you watch a, you know, Netflix series or Amazon series, they often begin the show with a, with like a, the climax. They won't kind of, they won't, don't give you any context. It's just like some crazy things happening. You're like, what's going on? And then the credits start. And then like the episode begins. And then like halfway through the episode, you realize like what the beginning scene was all about and sort of what led up to that. Um, so well i said quentin tarantino he he's the he's the name that's the name of the director it's it's on the slide here you see it underneath the picture here pulp fiction he's the director he directed pulp fiction he also directed another movie reservoir dogs which came out earlier same thing it's not it's not um it's not told in sequential order you know it's 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 out of order you get you 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 begin at some weird middle part uh and so I think Aristotle would say this is too confusing. It does get, it did confuse when it first, when, when, when this movie first came out, I remember um, a lot of my, my aunts and my uncles, uh, they were like, that movie's weird. I didn't understand it. I thought that guy was dead. And you know, I was just like, uh, they weren't the brightest bulbs, but anyway, I uh, love them, love them to death. Um, but yeah, like it, it's sort of dis, it's disorienting. And I think that that's probably what Aristotle's thinking, but I think we're kind of accustomed to it now. Modern audiences are kind of accustomed to this. You know, we, we, we get this, you know, not, not, not chronological order, but for Aristotle, no, a beginning must start at the beginning. You know, the middle is naturally there. Then the end, it just flows, right? There's this sort of for, very formulaic approach to plot construction. So, um, this this has to do with magnitude okay so this quote here i was saying you know why does it matter that it has a magnitude yeah duh like there's a beginning and an end so you can measure it like that that movie was 90 minutes that movie was you know you know however long it was a two-hour film um but he says though this is an important point when it comes to anything beautiful not just uh, works of imitative art but beauty in nature uh beautiful people uh for aristotle beauty itself requires uh a capacity to see the, the piece as a whole. And so if we can't see the piece as a whole, it doesn't have a certain magnitude, measurable thing, a, a measurable degree, then we can't make a good, a, an aesthetic judgment about it. So he says, to be beautiful, every whole made up of parts must not only present a certain order in its arrangement of parts, but also must be of a certain magnitude. Beauty is a matter of size and order and therefore impossible either one in a very minute creature since our perception becomes indistinct as it approaches instant uh, can't even say that word instantaneity um or in a creature of vast size as in the case uh instead of the object being seen all at once the unity and the wholeness of it is lost to the beholder just in the same way then as a beautiful whole is made up of parts or a beautiful living creature must be of some size um, but a size must to be taken in by the eye so the story or plot must be taken uh, sorry must be of some length but of a length to be taken in by the memory so i'm not so sure aristotle would have approved of maybe i mean again lord of the rings is not a tragedy but again it's it, it involves a, it's a plot there's a fable um I'm not sure he would have liked Netflix series that go on for like nine or 10 seasons and draw it all out. He seems to be saying you can't judge the beauty of those pieces because there's too much. There's too much story. There's too much plot line. The plot has to be able to be uh, explained very briefly and succinctly. If it can't, uh, then it's not going to be effective. You know, there, there's too much going on, right? So, so like Lord of the Rings, complete trilogy with deleted scenes added, uh, you know, for him is just, no, no, that's, that's, that's going to be impossible. You, you won't be able to judge the, the aesthetic merit or the beauty of it because it's too vast. And there's too, too many details. I suppose he would say something like the Odyssey or the Iliad, even though those are longer works, you, you could still say they're beautiful because their plot is simple enough. You know, the Odyssey 
is the story of this man trying to return home to his family after this war, this long journey home. And then when he gets there, he has to, you know, win back his wife and, and fight off all these suitors, basically. You know, that, I, well, how many sentences was that? Four or five sentences it took me to explain um, the uh, plot to the Odyssey. I suppose you could do that with Lord of the Rings, to be fair, right? Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I picked a bad example here. Uh, you, you could just say, it's about this invisible ring that makes everybody all powerful, but it also makes them evil. So this one guy has to go and destroy it. There, there you go. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than that. There's all these, like, pol all this politics and world creating, but I guess the plot is, is fairly straightforward. But that's how it should be for Aristotle. The plot should be straight to the point, easy to explain. Um, he says, the limit... Uh, set by the actual nature of the thing is this the longer the story consistently with its being com comprehensible as a whole the finer it is by reason of its magnitude so you can have a long story a very long complex story that can be uh, simplified and explained that is a very impressive feat for Aristotle so maybe I'm wrong about Lord of the Rings if I'm correct if, if, if that's the essence of the story this the ring that makes you evil and all-powerful that has to be destroyed and the journey, you know, it's a temptation to do it. Um, maybe that is a, a good plot for Aristotle. He says, as a rough general formula, a length which allows a hero passing by a series of probable or necessary stages from misfortune to happiness or from happiness to misfortune may suffice as a limit for the magnitude of the story. So um, that's all you need, right? Let me read that again. Okay. So, the length has to allow for a hero or heroine, right? It can be a female character, um, passes through a series of probable and necessary stages from misfortune to happiness. That's the thing, that's a happy story, a you know, drama, comedy, or from happiness to misfortune, tragedy. Right? That's all you need. That's that's what you need. Series of events that leads from happiness. And I love I love this. I don't know. Maybe maybe we should uh, skip this, but this is a uh, uh, the shapes of stories by Kurt Vonnegut and. Um, uh, if you're familiar with Vonnegut, he wrote a book called Slaughterhouse Five, which is probably his most famous book, but not my favorite. I think he's, he's got much better stuff out there. It's a good book, don't get me wrong. Uh, but he has this theory that all all stories have the same shape. Um, you know, there's there's the Cinderella is pretty obvious, I guess. So this this line here on the left is ill fortune and good fortune, right? He's totally getting this all from Arist Aristotle, right? So um, and then there's the beginning and the end, right? That's that's the uh, uh, you know the horizontal axis. So the beginning of the story, right? You've got the typical sort of man in the hole. Yeah, you know, he's he's this person's doing all right, things are going okay, but then there's this crazy problem that happens, they gotta figure it out, oh, but then it all gets resolved in the end, and they're even happier than they were to begin with, you know, that's, that's a typical plot shape, right, um, then there's the boy meets girl, right, there's just persons, like, not even really happy, just completely, completely average, but then they meet somebody and they fall in love and it's all great. Oh wait, but then there's this like really, really like horrible thing that separates them. And like now they don't love each other anymore. And now like there's this misunderstanding. And Oh wait, but it was just a misunderstanding and now we figured it out. Oh, so now we're back in love again. Yay, right? And then I love this. This is, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Cinderella, basically. So she starts off in poverty. She's this orphan. She's got the wicked stepsisters. And then, you know, things start to get better. She hears about this ball coming up and, the, you know, and, and, and this fairy godmother shows up and she says, hey, I'm going to get you this really great dress and I'm going to make you, you know, do you up your nails and your hair and you're going to have this really nice carriage and a horse and you're going to go to the ball. And then she has, meets the prince and they fall in love and it's really great. Oh, well, then midnight happens. Bam! it's back to like it's not as bad as it was before because she still has the memories of that wonderful night with the prince but she's still back to scrubbing the stairs for her wicked stepmother and her stepsisters oh well then there's the glass slipper that the, the prince found and then he meets her and they live happily ever after to infinity right that's the cinderella plot line and then i love this one at the end if you've ever read you wouldn't get the joke unless you've read kafka but if you ever read kafka it starts bad and then it just gets worse right it's like 
if, if a good example is the trial the, the one of his most famous novels unfinished but not really need to be finished. You kind of know where it's going. You know, this guy wakes up one morning and he's arrested and he's like, what am I arrested for? Uh, you know what you did. I, no, I don't. He's like, I can't believe you don't know. Just not knowing you're going to get even more penalties for this. You need to report. He's, he's just guilty for being like awake or whatever. And as he tries to find out more and more about his case and his trial, he gets more wrapped up and more, you know, confused. Uh, and so it goes from worse to worser. That's even a word. Uh, I had, you know, I, somebody mentioned Dan Harmon's story circle and I know I've watched that some video where he explains that and I can't quite remember what he says. So, um, you know, but that does ring a bell. I, I know that Dan Harmon was, is very, a big Kurt Vonnegut fan. So he might've got this idea riffing off of Vonnegut, but there, there's, there's a video, uh, I was going to show you, it's like five or six minutes, but then we got so much stuff to cover. Uh, but I recommend look up Kurt Vonnegut or just, just look up Vonnegut shapes of stories. And he explains it better than I would. It's pretty funny. Um, but yeah, uh, I know Dan Harmon was going to do a movie version of one of, uh, or he was going to do a, an Amazon series on one of Kurt Vonnegut's books, but I, I nothing ever came of it. This, uh, one of my favorite books is, but who knows? Um, so his, uh, so he basically says that story structure is supposed to be universal. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's where, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That's where Aristotle's going. Um, it depends on what you mean by universal. Um, that it always has the same sort of shape or it always, you know, like some sort of Joseph Campbell hero's journey. I don't know if that's what Aristotle is saying, but he would say it speaks about universal truths. It resonates with universals. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't know about the, the hero's journey. I, I would say, you know, I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, we'll get so sidetracked, but I, I, I imagine that Joseph Campbell was somewhat, uh, you know, uh, influenced by Greek theory and, and Aristotle. Uh, and certainly this doesn't, um, what Aristotle says doesn't contradict Joseph Campbell. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's like absolute parallels or not. I, to me, I think Joseph Campbell is, is reductionist. You know, I, I don't think every plot follows like this. You know, there's, there's more than, there's probably more than four shapes to stories. You know, I mean, Vonnegut is pretty, you know, I think he's being silly. He actually, I think he even says these are the four ones that work. Like these are the ones that will, that we're like, we'll enjoy it. Again, it's been a while since I watched his video, but uh, it's all on YouTube. Uh, wonderful place, isn't it? Right. All these, all these lectures you used to never be able to find these old recordings of like authors that are long gone. Um, so he says uh, about unity uh, plot that it does not consist as some suppose in having one man as a subject. Again, remember the characters are subordinate to the story and the action. So the, the, the idea that the story should revolve around a person, Aristotle thinks is misguided. So he says, an infinity of things befall that one man, some of which it is impossible to reduce to a unity, right? So, you, you know, if you're going to do a story, it's not going to revolve around everything about the man. You're going to talk about, he, he brushed his teeth, then he went and he had breakfast, then he went and he got gas for his car, and then he went and got to work. I mean, he's like, no, you, you, you go through the actions that are, that are essential and interesting and that are meaningful to the plot. The truth is that just as in the other imitative arts, one imitation is always one thing. So in poetry, the story as an imitation of action must represent one action, a complete whole with its several inc incidents so closely connected that, that the transposal or withdrawal of any of them will disjoin and dislocate the whole. For that which makes no perceptible difference by its presence or absence is no real part of the whole. This ties into what he said earlier. We went over this last week when we were talking about the golden mean and how he says what is beautiful is somehow it's, 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 it, it's moderate. It finds this middle ground between excess and deficiency, not too much, not too little. So your plot, does, you don't want too many details. You have all these details, it's distracting and it, it's confusing. Uh, and you don't want too little. If you leave out a scene, uh, it doesn't make any sense. 
I, I've, there's several movies I've heard that have been ruined because of this. That's why I have the deleted scene. Um, I know the one that came to my mind this morning when I was looking over this before class was the movie Natural Born Killers. And I remember when I saw that film, when it first came out in the movie theater, um, it, and, and then I saw it again when the director's cut was put on video and there were some extra, and they weren't even really, I wouldn't even say scenes. It was almost like just a cutaway or a weird shot, or you would see the, 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 the guy, um, what's his name, Mickey or whatever, the killer, uh, you'd see what was going on in his head. He'd have these flashbacks to his childhood. Um, and those weren't in the original movie. And so it totally changed the meaning of the film, I felt. You know, maybe I'm, I'm alone on that, but I felt it changed the, 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 the movie seems to completely glorify uh, violence. And, and, and anarchy and criminality. Uh, it, it completely seems to glorify that if you don't watch the director's cut. If you watch the director's cut, I think it's sort of a critique on our violent culture and our media and, and all that in general. It's not necessarily glorifying it. It's a comment on it. Um, so some say that he, you know, that Oliver Stone did a lousy job and it still glorifies violence despite, but I think that the director's cut is a lot more even-handed and it comes across better so but the, the idea here is that you know good works of art are just enough right they have a good plot is going to have just enough detail not too much not too little um so let's see uh poetry and philosophy now and finally we get to this is the part that i um this is the reason I'm giving you a few extra days on your paper because we didn't get to this last time and this is the fourth uh, topic so in case you wanted to write on the fourth topic uh, I guess you should listen up because this is where he addresses it um, and I've been hinting at it already I've already been kind of hinting at this point uh, so far in this lecture a few times uh, but what does he say about philosophy and poetry? And he compares uh, poetry to history as well. He says, from what we've said, it will be seen that the poet's function is to describe not the thing that has happened, but a kind of thing that might happen. In other words, what is possible as being probable or necessary. The distinction between the historian and poet is not in the one writing prose and the other writing verse. It consists really in this, that the one describes the thing that has been and the other a kind of thing that might be. Hence, poetry is something more philosophic and of graver import than history, since the statements are of a nature rather of universals whereas those of history are singulars. So this is a pretty controversial claim for him to make. And this is completely different from Plato. There's a lot of things you could say that Aristotle shares, a lot of ideas and, and assertions that he shares with Plato. But this is one he definitely doesn't. Aristotle has this high regard for art, for imitative art, for what he's calling poetry in this context, that it's even more true, or maybe true is the wrong word, it's more philosophic, which I would infer more true, it's more philosophic than history, right? When we're doing history, all we're doing is talking about particular events, particulars, right? This man did this, this woman did that, this group of people did these things, they went to war with this country. These are particular things that happened once, okay? So for Aristotle, poetry talks about things that happen all the time or might happen, right? Things that might be, things that are necessary or probable, as he puts it earlier in the quote. So when we're reading Oedipus, the king, this is uh, someone who is, you know, making poor judgments and do, in, in trying to be a good person and in the process doing something awful, which is, which is totally possible. It happens to all sorts of people. I'm trying to think of a better example to to uh, bring home Aristotle's point here. You know, I'm gonna. I, I don't know if we're gonna get to all the different types of tragedy today. I'm probably gonna skip it. We'll see how we're doing for time. Um, 
but I mentioned Breaking Bad later on in the uh, PowerPoint, and I would say that's a tragedy, that, that series. Although I think that it's too long for Aristotle, there's too many events, too many incidents, uh, the plot is too co complicated. But you might say Breaking Bad is a tragedy, and it's not just about Walter, whatever the guy's character's name is, you know, uh, uh, what's his nickname? Uh, um, oh, geez, it's gonna kill me now. Heisenberg, right, yeah, the physicist. Yeah, Heisenberg. It's not just about that man. It's about his tragic fall. It's about how ambition and desperation lead to just desperate criminal activities. I mean, that's one interpretation of it, we could say, right? So it's a universal truth. It's a philosophical truth. It's fictional that never happened. All his characters are made up, but it's teaching us something universal, right? Something about all of our beings, all of what we could all become under the right circumstances, right? What might be. Uh, as Aristotle puts it here. Okay. So, and when we're doing history, like I, you know, I have this picture here of, uh, from Verdi's Aida, uh, this opera but from Verdi. Uh, and, you know, it's based on historical figures, although Aida herself don't think ever existed, but a lot of the politics in it, and, but it's completely made up. And that's fine for Aristotle, right? He gives the artist, the poet, what we might call artistic license. He says the, the poet must be more the poet of his stories or plots than of his verses, inasmuch as he is a poet by virtue of the imitative element in his work. So his ability to copy and imitate things is what makes him an artist or her, right? The creator, the poet is a good poet or a good artist because of their ability to copy. Again, you're, you're going to see when we get, I keep repeating this, I don't think I've said it yet today, but I'll keep repeating it throughout the semester. As we get closer and closer to our day and age, you're going to see a rejection of this, this idea that art is simply imitation, that this is not, that's not all art is. It doesn't just copy, it doesn't just imitate, but Aristotle's kind of going with that. You know, imitative art, poes, you know, imitative poetry, uh, imitative techne, um, what makes a good artist good is his ability to do an imitation well. And it is actions that he imitates. So when I'm doing a plot or a play, I'm imitating actions. I'm writing down things that could happen, maybe. Uh, and if he should come to take a subject from actual history, he's nonetheless a poet for that. It's OK to use historical characters uh, as long as your imitation is good, visceral. It drives the audience to this emotional catharsis. And as I said, a little bit of artistic license, I think, is implied here. Um, tragedy, however, is an imitation not only of a complete action, we've talked about that has to be complete, self-contained, beginning, middle, and end, but also of incidents arousing pity and fear. Okay, so now we got to come back to this part of it. We've talked about, um, you know, actions, how the actions are arranged, but how about this arousement of pity and fear in the spectator, in the person watching the tragedy? Such incidents have the greatest effect on the mind when they occur unexpectedly and at the same time in consequence of one another. That seems almost paradoxical, paradoxical right? He's saying that things have to happen that, that they're surprising, you know, like unexpected. Oh, geez, very surprisingly. Oh, wow. But it makes sense. Oh, yeah, that totally would have happened. So that's kind of a tricky, tricky thing. You're, you know, it's trying to, kind of a tricky line you're trying to, to, to walk there between being plausible, it probably could happen, but also unexpected. There is more of the marvelous in them than if they happen of themselves or by mere chance. Even matters of chance seem most marvelous if there's an appearance of design, as it were, in them. As for instance, the statue of Midas at Argos killed the uh, killed the author of Midas's death by falling on him uh, when that happened, right? That was ironic. So even though it was just a chance, it still was like, oh, wow, the statue that that artist made killed the guy that killed the artist. Okay. For incidents like that, we think it not without a meaning. There's some sort of significance in it. It's like, this is a ha. A plot, therefore, of this sort is necessarily finer than others. Okay, so that's one element that is going to help arouse pity and fear, is this unexpectedness, but yet, okay, 
I get it. That does make sense. I see why that jerk, given his character, that's exactly what he would have said or done. So we go to these different types of plot. And he's going to talk about like how some are preferred to others and which ones are going to be better at eliciting these type of responses. For him, plots are either simple or complex. Obviously, he's going to, um, you know, once I define them and just explain them, it'll be pretty obvious why he's going to prefer the complex uh, plot types, when, especially when it comes to tragedy. So simple is a plot that has no peripete or discovery. And a complex is one that does have peripete or discovery. Um, now, peripety, I, I'm not really sure I'm saying that word correctly, uh, but basically it means a, a change of fortune, a reversal of fortune. Uh, and discovery is when something, well, just like it sounds, uh, when you discover something, how does he say it? From a, ch a change from ignorance to knowledge. That's what I have on the slide there. So yeah, discovery is just uh, this aha moment. Uh, he also mentioned suffering later on. Uh, this is a action of a destructive or painful nature. He says these should arise of the plot itself. He says they, they should arise naturally as elements of the plot. Uh, so as to be the consequence, either necessary or probable, of the antecedents, right, of what came before. All right, so now again, he's going to talk about what are the best and worst types of plot. And the way he decides this, again, is his standard, his artistic standard, is based on the telos, the aim, and that is what we're talking about right now, basically, what arouses fear, what arouses pity. And so that's going to be his standard of judgment. So which are the best plots for this? What are the worst plots for this? Um, so we ask the question, what is the, what is the poet to aim at and what is to, he to avoid when he constructs the plot? What are the conditions on which the tragic effect depends? He says it has to be complex. That's one thing, right? It has to have that peripety, right? That change of fortune, reversal of fortune. And or discovery, or probably both, hopefully both. That would be the best. And also has to imitate actions that would arouse fear and pity. It's not enough that there's a change of fortune. It has to be a certain type of change of fortune. It doesn't have to be just any kind of discovery. It has to be a certain type of discovery. That's that's you know what he's getting at here. One that elicits these particular emotions. It follows, therefore, that there are three forms of plot to be avoided. Okay, so which ones do we avoid? First, a good man must not be seen passing from happiness to misery. Why not? That seems like, wow, okay. We'll, 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 we'll understand why in a second. So the first one, you don't want somebody who's really, really good to go from happiness to misery. Or you don't want a bad man to go from misery to happiness. That one may be more obvious, okay? If you see somebody who's really evil, who's enjoying a bunch of good stuff, that's not gonna make you feel pity or fear for him you're going to feel maybe disgust but not pity, uh, pity and fear but what's wrong with the first one um he said that it's not fear inspiring or piteous but rather odious so what he means is it's it makes you disgusted like oh um because i suppose a good person if somebody's absolutely good and doesn't deserve it then we wouldn't be able to handle it what he wants is someone who's average like in the middle neither really really great nor really, really bad, just someone just like us, you know, someone who's got their flaws. And, and so that's the better character. Um, and that's gonna arouse the pity and fear. Um, you also have to avoid what he says, an extremely bad man falling from happiness to misery. Uh, Cause that one just, okay, great. Yeah, I'm happy he's, but there's, there's no, there's nothing, right? It's like just a boring plot. It's like, yeah, there's someone bad and we hate him and now he's happy, he's really happy and he's falling down and so what? Um, although, I don't know, maybe that can be done effectively. Who knows? That's sort of what you get with Barry Lyndon. Um, not my favorite movie by Stanley Kubrick. If you're familiar with Stanley Kubrick, it's another famous director. He did uh, Clockwork Orange, 2001, uh, The Shining. Uh, what else? He did so many movies. Um, uh, Dr. Strangelove. And Barry Lyndon is his least popular movie. Maybe this is why. 
because in Barry Lyndon, that's exactly what you get. You get this, let me back up and, and read it again, the, the way that Aristotle has it, an extremely bad man falling from happiness to misery. That's basically the plot of uh, Barry Lyndon. Yeah, best director of all time. Yeah, he's pretty good. I don't know best, but he's, he's up there. Um, but yeah, Barry Lyndon is pretty much, that's what, what Aristotle just described. That's the plot of Barry Lyndon, a very awful, horrible human being who basically gets pretty much, he goes through like a little bit of like trials and tribulations, but he makes out way pretty good and does really well for himself and screws over a lot of people. And at the very end, too, he just ends up in a tragic death, you know? So, and, and yeah, that's the least, that's, I guess that's um, Kubrick's least popular film. Maybe that's why, maybe Aristotle's right. I think it's a pretty good movie. I don't know if it's, my least favorite of his. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I've never ranked Kubrick films. Um, but he says, such a story may arouse a human feeling in us, but it will not move us to either fear or pity. Pity is occasioned by undeserved misfortune, right? We all think that this guy, Barry Lyndon, by the end of the movie, you're kind of like, yeah, dude, like you died the way you live, man. You got what you deserve. You're just, you know, you're a scumbag, you know, basically. But by the end of the movie, most people think that about this guy. He's just, you know, uh, very narcissistic, arrogant, selfish, you know, any bad character trait you can think of, he is. Um, so he says, you know, this pity is occasioned by undeserved misfortune and fear by that of one like ourselves. So there will be nothing either piteous or fear inspiring uh, in the situation, right? So again, we want someone that's more like us, that's not like perfect and this, you know, unblemished character, but we don't want some real, you know, screwball, jerk, evil, arrogant, Barry Lyndon type guy either. Uh, we want someone sort of in between, like Oedipus, at least this is what um, Aristotle claims. Oedipus is the perfect example. Um, there remains then the intermediate. This is always the middle for Aristotle, right? Always that golden mean, that, that intermediate. Um, so we want the intermediate kind of personage, a man who's not preeminently virtuous and just, whose misfortune, however, is brought upon him not by vice and depravity, but in some error of judgment of the number of those in the enjoyment of great reputation and prosperity. For example, Oedipus. So a couple things, like they have to be in the middle. They can't be like preeminently virtuous and just. But, and the misfortune doesn't come about because they're bad either. So they're not, it's not vice or depravity that makes them do the bad deed or, or leads them to the tragic uh, misfortune. Uh, it's just lack of judgment, error of judgment. And for some reason, he thinks that it has to be of the number of those in the enjoyment of great reputation and prosperity. So Oedipus was a king. It has to be someone who's like a, I don't know, in the Greek times, I guess it'd have to be a, a god or a king. You know, those are the main characters in those, those tragedies. We'll talk a little bit about this when we get to Nietzsche. Nietzsche says that the death of tragedy begins with uh, Euripides. And Euripides was, you know, I don't know if this is true, but uh, Nietzsche claims that Euripides was the first to represent the common people on stage as actors, and not just as, as, as extras or, or someone in the background, but as actual main characters. And he said that was sort of the end of tragedy and the beginning of comedy. And, um, but Aristotle's writing much before this, and, and he says, no, the characters have to be of like royal birth, they have to be popular or well-known people, but they can't be these like perfect people. They have to be in the middle between, you know, perfect and, and, and evil, you know, good and bad. And the plot, right now we get back to the plot. Um, the perfect plot must have a single and not, as some tell us, a double issue. The change in the hero's fortune must not be from misery to happiness, but on the contrary, from happiness to misery. And the cause of it must lie not in any depravity, but in some great error on his part, the man being either such as we described, not worse than that. So again, just kind of repeating the point I, I just made. I, I think this film, Chinatown, although I don't know if he starts from happiness and ends up in misery, he might just start kind of like, eh, 
you know, the main character in Chinatown is this private investigator who's not really a great guy, but he's not really an evil guy either. You know, he makes money basically helping uh, men and women catch their spouses cheating on them, right? He's a private investigator and he gets pulled into this plot uh, and he digs deeper and he starts to really care about this woman who hires him. And he starts to realize that there's some deeper things going on in politics and city politics are involved. And in the course of the movie, he does many things that he thinks are trying to help these people. And, and by, by doing them, uh, he actually guarantees that he doesn't help them, that he actually seals their fate. And in fact, one of them dies. So it's super tragic. You know, the end of the movie is like, oh my, you know, it really, it's a great, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, you know, and I, I have my reservations about liking it so much because the director uh, is, is such a POS. But, you know, but he makes good movies. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's a perfect example of what, uh, at least this formula that Aristotle is, and I think the guy that wrote the screenplay, oh, what's his name? Now it's gonna bug me. I can't remember, the, I, I actually usually don't remember screenwriters, but I, I usually remember, I actually used to know this guy's name. Uh, but he, I think he actually did base this, his whole plot structure on the Aristotle tragedy, right? And, uh, and the film certainly is. Um, I keep using the example of Oedipus and I still haven't really explained it yet. So I feel that we might have to wait till later. I'm assuming a lot of you have heard the story. I'll explain it eventually, but uh, Oedipus as well, he's supposed to be kind of like, you know, he's a well-meaning guy, he's not perfect. And, um, and, and but then everything just really goes wrong for him. And it's, it's really horrible and horrific. It, it arouses fear and pity, uh, but we're gonna get to, um, you know, how to write and diction, and then Aristotle's gonna give us a summary of a plot. And when we get there, maybe I'll give you a summary of Oedipus. That might be after the break. I'm not really sure how we're doing on time. But let me let me read a couple more slides here. Uh, and then I gotta take a breather. So um, I'm gonna check and see how we're doing on time. In fact, if somebody type in the time to the chat box, if you would, uh, so give me an idea. Um, so, okay, the best and worst types of plots. He says, the construction of plot that some rank first. Uh, okay, cool, 106, perfect, thank you. Um, I, I got, you know, let's go over about another 15 or 20. Okay, so the construction of plot, plot that some rank first, and he mentioned this type earlier, one with a double story, um, like the Odyssey, right? The Odyssey, part of the story is, is um, I wanted to say Ulysses, but that's his Roman name. What is it, Oedipus, not Oedipus. Um, Odysseus, you know, part of it, part of the plot of the Odyssey is Odysseus's journey home. And part of the plot is when he gets there, trying to get rid of all these suitors who are crowded around his wife. Um, and so I guess that's a double story. This movie here, another one of my favorite movies whose director has questionable morals, uh, also has a double plot, right? You've got the story of this, uh, you know, the guy on the left, um, you know, play, played by Alan Alda, He's uh, this optometrist who murders his mistress and he feels really guilty or he hires a hitman to murder his mistress because she's about to tell on him and get him, you know, his whole marriage will be ruined. Uh, but he feels horrible about it the whole movie and uh, is about to turn himself in. So he's like dealing with this guilt of murder. And then the other plot is of the Woody Allen character, uh, he, his romantic entanglement or his failures at, 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 at romantic entanglement with this love interest and how that just falls flat. And they meet each other at this, somehow their, their lives cross path at the last scene. And they have this you know, kind of deep conversation in the last scene of the movie. But um, it has a double plot and it is a great film and it works, you go back and forth, but he doesn't think this can work. He says that, um, um, you know, this is not a good plot, right? He says, uh, with the one with the double story and an opposite issue for the good and bad personages. It is ranked uh, first only through the weakness of the audiences. So maybe I'm just a weak audience member, right? The poets merely follow their public. Uh, writings wishes as it dictated, uh, sorry, uh, writing as its wishes dictate. But the pleasure here is not of tragedy. Uh, so it's, I think maybe he would say it's the spectacle. They're bored. They want, they want more distractions. They have short attention spans. And so this is the artist um, succumbing to what the public wants when what they really need, when they're, when they're going to a tragedy, they should, they should get this, you know, the sadness. And so that requires the kind of plot that he suggests, right? No B plots, no subplots for those of you who are film 
majors or, or writing majors, right? No B plots, okay? Um, the best or worst types of plot, even more on this, right? So the tragic fear and pity may be aroused by the spectacle, uh, but they may also be aroused by the very structure and incidents of the play, which is the better way and shows the better poet. So in other words, you can use spectacle to arouse pity, pity and fear, but that, that's, that's the cheap way. That's the less artistic way. That's the easy way. Um, you're not an artist, you're just, it's just shock value, I guess is sort of his argument here. Um, you know, I'm looking at this, these pictures I have. I, I've never seen this film, by the way, the Mel Gibson passion movie, but I, I have a feeling that this would apply to the passion. It's quite, it's quite violent. You know, it's supposed to be a very violent film. It's quite a spectacle. And, and his defense, a lot of, there were a lot of Christians who were quite offended by uh, this movie. Uh, for one, you know, there were a lot of people thought it was very anti-Semitic. I haven't really seen it, so I, I, I can't really make my own judgment. But there were even Christians who thought it was very just disgusting, pornographic, you know, a lot of words used to describe it. Uh, it was quite controversial. Um, but he, his defense, he, def his defense was, this is what our Lord went through and this is, this is what it was like. And so what better way to, uh, get you to feel, you know, your debt to Christ or, you know, you owe him for suffering for you than, than to show it like this, I think was his defense. Um, but yeah, I, I have a feeling that someone like Aristotle would say, this is just spectacle. It's not art. It's, you're just, you're, this is the easy way out. You, you know, you're going over the top. Again, I don't want to condemn the film without watching it, but um, this is what I'm sort of guessing. The plot, in fact, should be so framed that even without seeing things take place, he who simply hears the account of them should be filled with horror and pity at the incidents, which is just the effect that the mere recital of the story of Oedipus would have on one. To produce this same effect by means of the spectacle is less artistic and requires extraneous aid. Those, however, who make use of the spectacle to put, to put before us that which is merely monstrous and not productive of fear are not wholly out of touch with tragedy, but only its own proper pleasure. Okay, so I think now it's probably time I should tell you the story of Oedipus, in, just in case uh, you've never heard it before. Um, so he's claiming here that, again, a good story shouldn't require spectacle. You shouldn't need to use gore and blood, uh, you know, the, the, these, these representations to arouse pity and fear. Just hearing the story should be enough. <clears throat> so let me ask this question, though. I got 36 students in here. I'm wondering. Um, this is a pretty common myth, and I'm hoping that most of you heard it. Maybe everyone's heard it before, so I don't want to waste class time telling a story that everyone's already heard. Um, if you have never heard the story of Oedipus, then please type in, no, I've never heard it, and I'll, I'll go over it. I won't spend too much time on it, but I feel like we definitely need to cover it, because it's going to come up again, uh, believe it or not, even when we get past Aristotle. Okay, so there's quite a few of you who never heard it. Okay, well, it will arouse, I don't know about pity or fear, um, but it, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of, yeah, you just, just wait. Okay. So there's this man named Oedipus and there are different versions of this story. Okay. So maybe you've heard different versions. I'm just going to give you the sort of the essentials. Now Oedipus was born into a Royal family and his father was told by some seer, some wise prophetess or whatever, that this, this boy is going to grow up to murder you. He's going to murder you, and he's going to marry his mom, right? And um, this king is like, are you kidding me? That's not going to happen. There's no way. Take this baby out to the woods. So he tells his servants, take this baby out to the woods and kill it. So they take Oedipus, the baby, out to the woods, and they leave him there because they didn't want to kill a baby. The servants are like, um... I'm not going to kill this baby. Like, that's, that's not crazy. But, you know, I, the king will kill me if I don't, so I'm just going to leave this baby here. So the baby's, like, sleeping in the woods, and this, this shepherd couple 
you know, the, this old this old couple that works the, the land, you know, they're like walking through the forest one day and they find the baby and they adopt the child and they raise it as their own. And they never tell the child about where they found him. They just tell him, I'm your mom, I'm your dad. Well, one day Oedipus is going to town and to sell some sheep or whatever. And he runs into somebody who is a wise person, a seer who can see the fate and understands the gods, etc., and looks at Oedipus and tells him, I know your fate. You're gonna murder your father and you're gonna you're gonna marry your mother. And he says, That's crazy. I would never do that. He says, That's your fate. At this point, he thinks that those people that adopted him are his mother and father. So he gets as far away from them as he possibly can. And he goes to um, Colonus, right? Or no, Thebes. Thebes is the city that he eventually becomes the king of. Because he, he's a very popular man. On his road to Thebes, he encounters some troubles. He, um, he finally makes it to this big city that's far away from his, what he thinks are his parents. And on the way there, he, he encounters this caravan and he gets into a bit of a fight and he ends up having to kill uh, one of them and he runs. And when he gets to Thebes, the city is being terrorized by the Sphinx, which is this mythological creature who will not stop terrorizing the city until somebody can answer her riddle. Well, Oedipus is, is fairly clever. And so he's able to answer the Sphinx's riddle and the Sphinx goes away and he's a hero and everybody loves him. And, and the city is without a king. Their king has been murdered and no one knows who murdered him. And they've been trying to find out, but now they need a king to replace him. And Oedipus seems to be royal. He looks royal. He looks, you know, he's, he's valiant. He helped slay the Sphinx. Everything's great. Everyone loves this guy. So they're like, hey, why don't you marry our queen? Uh, our king's dead, um, you know, and she likes you. Y'all seem to get along. Um, and he's like, you know, she's a bit older than me, but hey, she's kind of cool. I mean, hey, she's a bit of a cougar, but I like her. Let's get this going, you know. So he gets married, and he's really popular, and everybody loves him, and he's a great king. But then there's this pestilence. Everyone starts getting sick. Flies start showing up. Dead corpses in the street. Everyone's dying. What's going on? Well, the gods are angry. Why are the gods angry? Gods must be appeased. I know why the gods are angry, thinks Oedipus. It's because my, my predecessor, the king, was murdered. And we still don't know who killed him. We need to investigate. We need to find out who it was that murdered our king. And then the gods will, will, will be happy. Justice will be served. So Oedipus conducts this investigation to investigate who murders the king. And what does he find out? Who knows the, the end of the story? Who murdered the king? Oedipus. He did. He murdered the king. So Oedipus murdered the king unknowingly. That was the man he murdered on the road to Thebes. And that man happened to be his father. And now he's married to his mother. And he's already had three children with her. And what does he do when he finds out that he killed his father, married his mother, had three kids with her? What does he do? And he kills himself. Close. Doesn't kill himself. He pulls out his eyes. He reaches in and he pulls out his own eyes. I don't think that's physically possible. What is the poet trying to say, perhaps? He couldn't handle the truth. He couldn't stand looking at it. He had to sort of blind himself for life because he couldn't live with what he did to himself. And at no fault of his own along this journey, everything he did, all the evil, disgusting things that we find out, were done in ignorance. So this is, I guess, for Aristotle, like the perfect plot. You know, you don't have to embellish it at all. You can just talk about it and you don't have to have a good actor. You don't have to have a good storyteller. You tell people about this story and they're like, oh man, that's messed up. <laughs> you know? so, so that's the perfect plot for Aristotle or one example of it. And he's gonna get to some more uh, here in a minute. But I think this is probably, this is a pretty good stopping point. Um, yeah, this, I mean, we're kind of halfway through the, his comments on the best and worst type of plots, but I think we've reached a good, a good place to stop. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and um, let me pause the recording here. And then I'm going to share the screen. Let's get back to that PowerPoint.
So we're in the middle of talking about the best and worst types of plots. Uh, and then at the end, we'll talk about, you know, this is an interesting thing. I don't think we saw this with Plato, but we're going to get to this hierarchy of poetry or hierarchy of the arts. And this is also a recurring theme you'll see throughout the course. Not, I don't want to say every philosopher does this, but a lot of them do, where they'll talk about which, you know, is music better than, than poetry or, or, or is poetry better than music or or painting, which of the arts are the best and why? Um, you know, I, I always thought that was sort of a silly thing, question, or but you know, it's maybe a matter of taste. But anyways, you'll see with Aristotle, we'll see his, his take and why he thinks tragedy is superior to epic poetry. But let's, uh, let's continue where we left off. Like I said, we're uh, going over what makes plots good, what makes them bad, uh, particularly with, with regard to tragic plots, a tragedy. And so remember, tragedy's trying to invoke pity and fear. So the piteous part, he says, uh, you know, let's think about the characters. What if they're friends? What if they're enemies? Or what if they just don't even know each other and they're indifferent to each other? He says, this, and two, that doesn't really move us to pity. They hate each other. If, if something goes wrong between them, the only thing that we really pity is the person who suffers the injury or whatnot. If they're indifferent, then maybe it's boring. So he says, whenever the tragic deed, however, is done within the family, when murder or the like is done or meditated by brother on brother, by son on father, by mother on son or son on mother, these are the situations the poet should seek after, right? So, so for him, the, the best tragedies are ones that involve, you know, murder and intrigue with it, because that, that's the worst betrayal. My own brother, right? I knew it was you, Fredo. I don't know if y'all seen that movie, Godfather Part Two, but right? I knew it was you, Fredo. You did it. <laughs> you framed me. Uh, you know that that's 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 gonna make the audience even more tremble with pity. You know, at at the situation, I suppose. He says there's a right way to treat these tragic situations, and he gives a list of all the possibilities. Um, so the first one, the deed of horror is done knowingly and consciously. If you've ever read um, Orestes, or no, no, Agamemnon is the name of the, the actual uh, play. And, um, or is it? No, it's, I, I might get, uh, I think Agamemnon is the one before it. It's a part of a trilogy. But the Oresteia, where Orestes avenges his father's murder by murdering his mom, um, he murders his mom knowingly. In, you know, when, when Oedipus murdered his father, he didn't know. Uh, you know, that, that's the second one, right? The deed of horror is done in ignorance, but it's followed by discovery. So Oedipus kills his father, doesn't know it's his father, later on finds out. Uh, the third, uh, he says, the, the one is meditating some deadly injury to another in ignorance of his relationship uh, to make the discovery in time to draw back. That is kind of confusing. Um, I didn't really know how to summarize it in a brief sort of phrase, so I just gave the quote there. But it is the plot of Iphigenia at Aulis, and he'll give us that plot in a minute. We'll read it from the textbook. It's it's a plot summary that he gives us. But again, it's one meditate. You you you're going to do something really evil to someone else, not knowing your relationship to that person but then you make the discovery just in time to draw back. And that's what happens in Iphigenia at Aulis. Her brother's gonna murder her, or get her, but then figures out it's his sister. No, no, he's gonna be sacrificed. That's what it is. He's gonna be sacrificed. Um, and then right when he's about to be sacrificed, her, his, the sister walks in and says, no, don't do it, that's my brother, right? Because she controls the tribe or whatever. So yeah, anyway. Number four, he says the deed of, he says this is the worst. The fourth is kind of the most boring. Um, I'm trying to think of, 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 a, of a movie or a, or, a, or a tragedy like this and none of them, none come to mind. So if anybody has anything in their mind and wants to help me out here, um, you know, be interested. But this is where the deed of horror is actually not done, but it's only meditated on knowingly and consciously. So maybe, you know, some movie where 
somebody, you know, Julius Caesar, where Julius Caesar never gets murdered. <laughs> you know, like, there's a plot, and they're like, we're going to kill him. He's, he's getting too big for Rome. Uh, come on, Brutus, let's do this. And then at the last minute, they're like, eh, we better not. Yeah, like that would kind of suck. That the Julius Caesar would not be this the same Julius Caesar that, that it is. It wouldn't be as good of a, a play. Um, so he says one is good, two is even better uh, because there's nothing odious in it, uh, and the discovery will serve to astound us. You might argue against that now that you've heard the story of Oedipus. There's nothing odious in it. The guy slept with his mom and he killed his dad. But I guess he, what he's saying here is that he didn't know it, right? He had no idea. It was not his fault. So we're kind of like, geez, like that's really gross and I'm disgusted by it. But like he didn't know. And, and man, like that's horrible. Geez. Um, he says the third is the best of all, though, like the one that Iphigenia uh, is an example of. Uh, he says, you know, it, he doesn't really give a reason for that, though, at least that I could find. And for him, the fourth one is just odious and untragic. There's really no uh, pity or fear aroused by the fourth type of plot. Um, so what kind of characters do we want to write? He says they, and this is confusing for me because I'm not quite sure. He doesn't elaborate enough on it for me to give a really straight interpretation. Because earlier he said that at least when we're talking about tragedies, maybe this is just general advice for writing. But when he talked about tragedies, he said that the characters, you don't want them to be supremely good and just and virtuous, but you don't want them to be scumbags either. You want them to be just sort of average. So this first point about writing characters throws me off. They shall be good. I don't know if he means just good as an interesting, like when you write a character, make it a good character, not just some like fill in. You know, he's got to actually, this would make sense given his theory of how plot is so important the characters should serve the plot. So maybe by good, that's what he means. They're good, like a good villain. You know, the, the, I, I've been watching this show, uh, The Boys, recently. I don't know if anybody here has been watching The Boys. Uh, it's pretty violent. If you don't like violent stuff, you probably shouldn't watch it. But uh, I've been enjoying it. I got to say, I, I, I think I have a new favorite villain uh, is Homelander. He's pretty evil. He's a good villain, I think. Um, uh, anyway. Maybe that's what Aristotle means here. Like not good as in virtuous, but good as in well, you know, well thought out, which seems kind of like vague and not very helpful to a writer. Okay, good. What, what do you mean? They should be appropriate. And here's his, his, his sort of essentialism here, right? The men have to be manly. They can't act like women, right? There's uh, Aristotle's old fashioned approach to writing, right? They have to act like the you know, if, 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 you know, and maybe to be serious, right, somebody who, if you're, if you're um, representing somebody who's working class, they have to speak like someone who's working class. You don't want them speaking, you know, some academic language, unless they happen to be some nerd working class person who reads books also while he, you know, works at the factory. But, but you know, uh, you, you get the point. They have to be appropriate, he says. They have to be like reality remember for him poetry poesis tragedy it's imitation you imitate actions so they have to be real or realistic real like uh, and they have to be consistent he says and the same throughout so you know the character has to act like we should expect that character to act given the, the nature of the character um, he says even if they're inconsistent characters they have to be consistently inconsistent if that makes any sense Okay, so, and now he gets into all the different types of discovery. I don't know if we should dwell on this too much, you know, but like, so remember discovery is when, you know, it's the moment that Oedipus realizes that what he's done is horrible, that he's married his mom and killed his father. Um, one, one example, he said, or one type is by signs or marks. He thinks that's the least artistic. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a lazy writer and you, you can't come up with anything creative and you can't come up with the way for the plot and the action to produce the discovery, you just do like, oh, they were wearing a symbol from my tribe. That's how I knew it was him, you know, or whatever, right? That would be an example. Um, the second, made directly by the poet. Uh, this one is also very inartistic. He says, uh, Orestes is made to say himself what the poet rather than the story demands. You know, I, I mentioned Orestes earlier. He murders his mother, 
because his mother killed his father, right? You know, his father, Agamemnon, it's, it's a big back and forth, really. Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter to the gods because there was a storm at sea. So Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter. When Agamemnon gets back home, his wife's not happy that he sacrificed his daughter, so she murders him. And then now Orestes, his son, is like, you killed my father, now I've got to kill you. So it's just, the family's a bloodbath. It's just, a, it's just the most, the, the very dysfunctional. But, but anyway, if you read um, Aeschylus, this, the, the play where Orestes comes to town to get revenge, the opening part, it has him standing in front of his father's grave, basically telling us what he's going to do. And I think what, er what Aristotle is saying here is that's very inartistic, that Orestes is just standing there saying, I'm here because my mother killed my dad, and I'm going to get revenge on him. You know, it's like, you could have had us gathered that from the plot we could have gathered that by his actions um so as as he says the poet has Orestes say what the story demands um so so that's that's again very lazy writing for aristotle also through memory that's another form of discovery uh from a man's consciousness being awakened by something being seen if you've ever seen alfred hitchcock's um vertigo uh, there's a scene in the movie where he looks at this woman's necklace and he remembers and he connects all these events and then he knows she's the one that did it and and you know so um i don't want to i don't want to spoil it too much for you if you ever watch the movie but yeah he sees the necklace and and he remembers all these things you're her you know so so uh through reasoning i i, I guess um Reasoning, I, I, the only example I could think of was like Game of Thrones season one, and maybe some of you have never seen Game of Thrones, but at the end of the first season, um, the, the guy who's the hand, the, 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 the advisor for the king, he starts to realize who murdered the previous king through reasoning, basically, you know, he hears some, the, the seed is strong or some, some weird clue. And he goes and looks through all this genealogy and he reads all these books in, 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 in the Royal uh, library about family trees. And then through reasoning, he's like, oh my goodness, that person is related to this, you know? And, and, and so that's maybe an example of discovery through reasoning. This number five, I'm not really even sure. I mean, he he tell he says it's like in in the uh, the Odyssey, when Ulysses is given his bow uh, by the sun, the sun hands Ulysses the bow. There's a scene where all the suitors are trying to use Ulysses' bow, but nobody can use it because it's so hard to use. You have to be really strong and hold it just a certain right way, and only Ulyss Ulysses knows how to hold it. Um, and his son knows this and sets it up and so um ulysses doesn't remember the bow i think that's that's what um aristotle means here so comp composite discovery it's it's the sun mistakenly thinking that ulysses or, i mean oedipus I, or not oedipus sorry odysseus i always say ulysses that's the roman name but yeah the son, the kid, thinks his father is going to remember the bow, and the father doesn't. But it works out anyway. It works out anyway because he's able to use it. He picks it up, and he's able to hold it. I guess he has muscle memory or something like that. But it's, it's discovery arising from bad reasoning on the side of the other party, in this, in this case, the son, who thinks that it's going to work. It doesn't work the right way, but it works good enough. Um, number six arising from the incidents themselves. This is the best one according to Aristotle and Oedipus is one, you know, the incidents lead to discovery, right? Naturally, things occur that lead us to understanding what happened and then it, you know, it happens. Iphigenia, we'll get to the, the plot of Iphigenia in, in a moment, but that's another similar situation. Things happen, there's a whole chain of events and then aha, there's this aha moment and it's a lot more effective, a lot more artistic, harder to write, harder to create. Okay, now we're getting to diction, right? How is the how are the words to be formed? How are the words to be written? Um, how are things supposed to be written out? At the time when he's constructing his plots and engaged in the diction which they're worked out, the poet should remember one to put actual scenes as far as possible before his eyes, 
in this way, seeing everything with the vividness of an eyewitness, as it were, he will devise what is appropriate and be less, least likely to overlook in, uh, in, uh, in concrete, uh, I can't even say that, congruities, incongruities. So basically, picture yourself in the scene. This is anti-Plato also, I, I, I would say. You know, for Plato, your imagination well, may, maybe Plato would have to say, yes, those lowly peasant poets, I suppose they would have to do this. But philosophers picturing images in their head, they just need to think about intellectual abstract ideas and forms, uh, which have no, yeah, like, so you're using too much imagination, Aristotle. I would be afraid that that's what Plato would want to chime in here. But that would be making you an effective writer. If you're going to write about living in the war, living through the war, you have to imagine yourself living in a war and bullets flying and you're, you might die any minute. You know, you're there in the foxhole. I mean, and if you haven't been there, it's really hard to do that without just picturing it. And even then you're going to kind of fall short. But to be a good artist, this is the first step. And then two, he says, as far as may be, the poet should even act out, this is also anti-Plato, act out his stories with the very gestures of his personages. So copy, mimic them. You know, if they're scared, you know, try to act scared and shivered and see how it feels physically so you can describe it in your, in your poems, in your, in, your, in your art, in your writing. Given the same natural qualifications, he who feels the emotions to be described will be the most convincing. Distress and anger, for instance, are portrayed more truthfully by one who is feeling them at the moment. Good. So yeah, get in the character, own that character. You're going to be a better artist for it, I suppose. And even if you're crazy, this is always, this is a fun thing about Aristotle. You know, Aristotle's always seen as the super sober philosopher. He kind of is. Um, he's definitely not quite as sober as Plato. I mean, that guy's the super buzzkill of all time. You know, at least, at least Aristotle will let us go see the movies and have a little fun and, 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 and uh, you know, enjoy stuff to a certain degree. Um, but he is a pretty, he is a pretty conservative philosopher, I suppose you could say. Aristotle is. But this is definitely something that's a, a bit interesting and weird and off the wall about uh, Aristotle. He says this about genius uh, too, but he says that madness uh, is something that uh, helps poetry, right? Poetry demands a man with a special gift for it or else someone with a touch of madness. The former can easily assume the required mood, the latter may actually be beside himself with emotion. In a way, this does remind me a little bit of what was said by Plato in Ion about how, you know, he was talking, remember when Socrates was talking to Ion and asking him about when he was giving his best performances, was he even there or was he beside himself? Wasn't he lost in some frenzy and actually felt like he was in the scenes that he was describing? Um, so I think this is akin to that sort of notion. And Aristotle concurs, yes, that poetry is, is helped with a bit of craziness. Uh, it, it helps us tap into those, uh, those emotions that are portrayed, that are imitated in the work of art. So, so far, you know, what do we do? We put the scenes in our head. Um, we should act out the actual scenes with these gestures. We should mimic them. Remember, Plato doesn't like that. You know, if we act like fools, we might become fools. But Plato is more of a paternalistic uh, governor, right? You've got to do what I say, uh, you know, bad influences and all this stuff. Everything's censored. I think Aristotle allows us a little bit more uh, leeway. Uh, and three, he should also, this is, the, this is new here, he should simplify and reduce his story to what Aristotle calls a universal form. So to the, I guess what you might call the bare essentials, the, the meat of the story, the bare bones. He says you have to simplify it to that and only after that should you add things, should you lengthen it and insert episodes and ornamentation. So again, he uses Iphigenia, I, so I said this earlier, we're finally going to get to the quote here. He uses the, the plot of Iphigenia at Aulis and the plot from the Odyssey uh, as examples to try to explain what he means by a universal form. So if you've got, if you've got the textbook, you can open it up to page 115, and I'll just sort of read his description here. Uh, the Odyssey, oddly enough, even though it's an epic poem, a much longer one, 
uh, it seems like you can summarize it a lot quicker than you can Iphigenia, which seems to contradict, or at least uh, maybe not contradict, uh, doesn't seem to bode well for his claim that the more simple the plot is, the better. Um, so let me read the, the quote here. Um, this is Iphigenia. Okay, this starts at the top of 115. A certain maiden, having been offered in sacrifice and spirit, spirited away from her sacrificers into another land where the custom was to sacrifice all strangers to the goddess, she was made, she was made there the priestess of this rite. So this woman, Iphigenia, she's supposed to be sacrificed. Her sacrificers sneak her away. They don't actually sacrifice her to some island. And on the island, they make her the priest of some ritual. She's the head priestess. And uh, she takes part in this. It's kind of ironic. She was supposed to be a sacrifice. Now she finds this culture of people who like to sacrifice. Uh, uh, um, you know, how, does, how does he put it? sacrifice all strangers to the goddess she was made the priestess of this rite. long after that the brother of her her iphigenia's brother and, and there's different versions of this but this is aristotle's version long after this the brother happened to come he happens to come up to the island the fact however of the oracle having for a certain reason bidden him to go thither and his object in going are outside the plot of the play on his coming, he was arrested and about to be sacrificed because he's a stranger. They sacrifice all strangers, except for Iphigenia, I guess. She's the priestess. Say, so on his coming, he was arrested, about to be sacrificed when he revealed who he was, either as Euripides puts it or as Polydius puts it, by the not improbable exclamation, so I too am doomed to be sacrificed as my sister was. And the dis this disclosure led to his salvation, right? So the brothers going off on some journey due to some oracle, he happens upon this island, he's about to be sacrificed. And then as he's, when he's about to be sacrificed, he says, I guess my fate is gonna be the same as my sister's. And the priestess says, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? She finds out that he's the brother and, and saves him at the last minute. So that took a long time to explain, uh, but that's the plot. And, and, and it's a pretty good plot. I, I mean, it is, but it's definitely not as simple as the, the Odyssey. The Odyssey is pretty straightforward. It's, it's there at the bottom. A certain man has been abroad many years. Poseidon, the sea god, is ever on the watch for him, and he's all alone. Matters at home have come to this, that his substance is being wasted and his son's death plotted by suitors to his wife. Then he arrives there himself after his grievous sufferings, reveals himself, reveals himself and falls on his enemies. And the end is his salvation and their death. That's more, I think that's a much more straightforward plot. So if you're an artist or a writer who's gonna write your own version of Iphigenia or your own version of the Odyssey, that's, that's pretty much what a lot of these Greek poets did. They didn't come up with new stories. They would just get old stories that were already told or just an episode from the Apology or from the, uh, from the Odyssey or an episode from the Iliad from Homer and they'd make a whole play out of it. It was sort of like fan fiction, you know, almost like these plays were like fan fiction. So if you're, if you're writing fan fiction, you, you know, you get the essence of that story, the, what he's calling the universal form of that story and then you only add what's necessary to make it beautiful and move the plot along so once the universal form is laid out the next thing he says is to work out the episodes or what he calls the accessory incidents uh, one must f mind however that the episodes are appropriate like the fit of madness in orestes which led to his arrest and the purifying which brought about his salvation so again you don't want to add a bunch of extra stuff just to have it there, just because it's cool, just because it looks good. It has to be relevant to the plot. It has to serve the plot. All right, so just to recap, right? So first, the, when you're writing, put the scenes in your mind. Imagine yourself there. Act out the actual story with gestures. Um, 
then simplify it to a universal form and only afterwards lengthen it with episodes. All right, and then fourth part, keep in mind that every tragedy is part complication, uh, part denouement. What does that mean? Complication is everything from the beginning of the story to the point where things start to change, where there's a reversal of fortune in the hero, right? The hero has a reversal of fortune. That's the complication. The denouement is the resolution of that. Everything from the beginning of that change till the resolution, till the end of the story. So we have to sort of keep that structure in mind. Four types of tragedy. There's the complex. That's the good one, right? Uh, the one we've talked about so far. There are other ones that are effective as well, though. Um, he doesn't give us examples of all these. Uh, I came up with some of my own. The tragedy of suffering. Ajax is a good example of this. There's a play. Um, Sophocles wrote Ajax, I believe. Was it Sophocles? I, I'm looking at my bookshelf. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was it, it was Sophocles who wrote Ajax. Could have been Euripides, but it, that's not important. It, it's a tragedy of suffering because Ajax is this warrior who gets really pissed off at Odysseus because Odysseus gets, uh, after the war is over and everybody's all like, you know, won the battle, Odysseus claims Achilles armor and weapons. And Ajax doesn't think he deserves them. He says, Achilles didn't even like you. And you're and you were a jerk and you're a sly bastard who's selfish and never did anything for the war. And I, Ajax, fought bravely in battle and 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 and, and I slayed all these generals on the other side. So I deserve Achilles' weapons. And so he wants to murder Odysseus, but I forget which god it is who likes Odysseus and is watching after Odysseus. He makes Ajax believe that all these cows in this barnyard are Odysseus. And so Ajax just starts hacking. It's just, uh, it's a bloodbath. It's just, it's, it's, it's a spectacle, really. Uh, it's a very violent play. But at the end of it, Ajax finally comes to his senses and realizes what he's done and all the damage he's caused and all the blood and that he's just made a fool of himself and he commits suicide. So like, that's a tragedy of suffering, tragedy of character. I already mentioned Breaking Bad earlier. I think that's a good example of tragedy of character. It's a tragedy, you know, the man was flawed and his sort of ambition, his pride, uh, you know, led to this dark place uh, that he couldn't get out of. And he had this deep, dark hole. And, and then the spectacle, Prometheus bound, right? If, you've, if you're familiar with Aeschylus and Prometheus, Prometheus was a, a, one, of the, one of the titans who, gave man fire and and for for giving humans fire the olympian gods zeus in particular wanted to punish him and so they tie prometheus to this rock where he, his his insides are devoured by a bird all day and then overnight they heal just to be devoured again right so he's in constant pain and agony and suffering right so that's and the whole play. If you, if you've ever seen it performed, there's actually a really good uh, Oxford uh, Oxford University has a Greek uh, tragedy society, or they they, they reenact Greek tra tragedies. So they do it in the actual original Greek with subtitles. That used to be on YouTube. They had Prometheus Bound, and it is quite a spectacle. The whole play is just this guy chained up, you know, kind of kind of crucified, like like you know like Christ or something. Uh, and, 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 and I mean, you will see this when we get to Nietzsche. Nietzsche makes quite a bit out of the Prometheus myth. So maybe I shouldn't uh, spend too much time commenting on it here. But these are the four types of tragedy. Aristotle seems to prefer the uh, complex. He thinks that that's more artistic. Um, you know, he doesn't really come out and say this, but I, it just seems that way from what, you know, how, how, and again, this might be just based on our, the fragmentary nature of the works we have. If we had a fuller picture of Aristotle, uh, maybe I would think otherwise. So other words of advice, uh, the sixth thing he says, never write a tragedy on an epic body of incident. Uh, for, for, uh, for instance, you know, you, you wouldn't want to do a tragedy on the entire Odyssey. That play would be too long. The audience would lose interest. It's hard to follow. Um, I don't think he would like this Netflix binging culture, watching a whole season, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious what Aristotle would think about that. The chorus, okay, now this is something most of you might, you know, or at least a good handful of you probably don't know about Greek 
tragedies and Greek plays in general, they always involved a chorus. So there was, you know, just like you would imagine in a modern play, dialogue, characters talking and actions, but in between some scenes or even sometimes in the middle of a scene, there would be a chorus, just like it sounds, a bunch of people singing, reciting verses. And usually it was a response to what was going on, the actions that were going on on the stage. So he says the chorus, that, that sort of musical melodic part that accompanies the action, he says should be regarded as one of the actors. It should be an integral part of the play. It has to have something to do with the plot. There are, there are examples like I, I list here Aristophanes frogs, well list, I just, that's one thing I mentioned. I don't know if he would have liked that. A lot of the chorus in frogs is just really absurd. It's just a bunch of fart noises and ribbits and stuff and doesn't really do much to move the plot along. So I think that Aristotle might think, well, that might be funny. Maybe that is appropriate for comedy, but certainly that's not the way the chorus would work in this regard, in the tragic, uh, tragic play. Okay, more about diction. It should be clear, not mean. What he means by that is it shouldn't be obscure. It shouldn't be something that is just too extreme one way or the other should be made of ordinary words and things, but you should also sprinkle in, he says, some unfamiliar strange words used in a, a non-prosaic way and artfully, not awkwardly, uh, to kind of spice it up. He says, and he also recommends long, curtailed, or altered forms of words, but only in moderation. Uh, what is he talking about, long, curtailed, altered? I can't think of an example. Maybe somebody can jump in and help me here. But I know hip hop, you know, in rap, this is a lot. You know, a lot of times uh, they use slang, you know, the, like the word bae instead of like baby, I guess, to, just to make it, just to have the right amount of, or, or they'll drag a word out, make it a little bit longer to rhyme, or they'll pr mispronounce it slightly to make it rhyme. Um, so altered forms of words, long curtailed forms of words, he recommends that, but don't overdo it, right? The greatest thing he says by far is to be a master of metaphor. And it's not something you can teach though, he says, you cannot learn it from others. It is also a sign of genius, since a good metaphor implies an intuitive perception of a similarity of dissimilars. I like that's an interesting description of what a metaphor is. It's a perception of the similarity of dissimilar uh, of dissimilars your eyes were aqua blue aqua blue no well yeah no i don't know diction and narrative poetry has much in common with tragedy a likely impossibility is always preferable to an unconvincing possibility the story should never be made up of improbable incidents. There should be nothing of, of that sort in it. If, however, such incidents are unavoidable, they should be outside the piece. Man, I can't think of a good example of this, but you know, like there's some of those, there's some movies that you might watch where they cut out a scene, you know, or they don't even cut it out. They just don't tell you what happened. You're like, wait, how did that guy ever get out of that, that last thing? Like, I thought he was going to die and now he escaped and he got into this area and he's saving Supergirl or whatever. I mean, like, they, they, it, usually like, it's something you'll let go. Um, I bet like if there's some Star Wars nerds here, there's probably all sorts of like fan fiction out there to, you know, make up for plots in the ho holes in the plot, basically, where it's like, wait a minute. I think that that's partly what Aristotle is warning against here. No holes in the plot. On the other hand, you also want to make your, even if you're talking about fantastical things, you want to make them somewhat believable. They have to be somewhat convincing. Um, not these completely improbable uh, incidents. I talked, I was talking about Game of Thrones earlier. I know at the last season, was very disappointing for a lot of people. There were there was this one thing that happened in that season that really like threw me off was there were these evil zombie creatures. They were called White Walkers, I think, and they weren't supposed to be able to go into water. But then in season nine, 
they're able to pull this dragon out of the water. Like this dragon dies and falls into the water and they're able to pull it out of the water. And I was always like, oh, it's, it's bothered me. I could, I could, I mean, come on. Like I'm willing to suspend my disbelief enough to believe in zombie white walkers and dragons, but it still was like, you know, inconsistent within the, yeah, you know, within the world of the story. Um, okay. More on diction. He says, if you're overly elaborate on diction, uh, don't do that, right? Don't do this. It's required only in places where there's no action. You know, if there's a narrative portion, if there's a prologue, you might have to have some fancy, wordy stuff. But in dialogue, he says, where there's character and thought, overly ornate diction kind of obscures the character. I tend to agree on this. I don't know. Maybe you've watched some British dramas. I never watched Downton Abbey, but I'm imagining he wouldn't like Downton Abbey because it might be this, you know, very prim and proper and we're going to speak British and have very long sentences and very sophisticated dialogue. And you have to at least be SAT level to understand what we're talking about. Um, you know, for Aristotle, I don't think he would think this is going to be effective that when we're reading, you know, descriptions, sure, but when we're hearing dialogue, it doesn't have to be overly ornate. It can be more like we just talk in real life. Okay. How does the poet make mistakes? Uh, there are a couple ways that the poet makes mistakes. I got two more slides after this, so we're almost done. Um, so remember for Aristotle, it's all about aim, the telos, okay? and the means how, how do i get to that aim okay and i have to find some moderation to do this right the right correct way is moderate okay for a plant we were using that example of the plant a couple classes ago uh to, to be a good plant it has to get just enough sunlight just enough water not too much not too little so we're looking at aims the plant wants to blossom to bloom and the way to get to that aim, the means, is the golden mean, right? Is that sort of, is that, 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 that mean between excess and virtue, sorry, excess and deficiency. Not too much, not too little. Okay. So you would think errors in poetry, errors in art have something to do with this. Too much, too little. Uh, maybe there's more to it than that. Let's read what he has here. He enumerates different errors, different faults, some he calls direct, some are indirect, okay? Direct errors are when, you know, the poet meant to describe something correctly, but failed. So the poet intended to adequately express something sad, and it came out really goofy, and it came out really funny, or something like that. Um, and then accidentally, um, he says, that's when it's connected with the art itself. So the techne, maybe there's a, maybe there's a technical error. I know that one of my favorite films, Apocalypse Now, it's always bugged me because at the very end of the movie, there's just one in slight imperfection. To me, that movie is a perfect movie. Every shot, every cut, every angle, the acting, the lighting. I mean, it, it's a perfect film. It is a perfect movie, except for there's this one part at the end where maybe they lost the footage, but it's a jump cut where he's flipping through the diary of Colonel Kurtz and he's flipping and flipping, and then all of a sudden it cuts and the book's fully open or something. And it's very subtle, it's only a second, but it kind of like, it's a technical difficulty. And Aristotle is gonna forgive him for that. I guess I will too. I'll forgive Francis Ford Coppola for that one glitch and that otherwise perfect film. Um, so, but the first one he says is the fault of the poet. If the poet's trying to be funny and he's actually offensive, or if he's trying to be uh, scary and he's actually just silly then that's not good fact I heard this about I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with the singer uh, Glenn Danzig uh, but Dan Danzig used to play uh, he used to sing for a band the Misfits I see a lot of younger people wear the Misfits t-shirt so maybe you do know who Danzig is well I haven't seen this film but apparently Danzig just recently like uh, maybe a year or two ago Danzig made a movie um, that he thought was a scary movie 
Like he wanted to be like really scary and freaked out. And he showed it to all his friends and they thought it was a satire. They thought it was hilarious, like really campy. And apparently he got all offended. He's all, hey, uh, it's supposed to be scary, man. You know, <laughs> it's like, but it was just so, so over the top that they just laughed at it, you know? So I think that Aristotle would say that's, that he, he failed. That, that's the failure. That's, that's the error of the poet there. Um, other faults he mentions, right? Here's a list of five faults he mentions in poetry. Things are impossible. Like you see something and you're like, that's just, come on. That just, no, it's not believable. Uh, or improbable, which is maybe slightly less worse. Corrupting, I'm not sure what he means by that. Maybe it's just not, a, you know, maybe he's thinking Plato here. Uh, contradictory, that's pretty straightforward. So uh, maybe some character acts a way that, that that character wouldn't act or contradicts themselves, or there's just some inconsistencies in the movie itself in, in one episode to another. And then again, uh, kind of a repeat against technical correctness. Um, you know, I know that can bother some people sometimes if you're watching a science fiction movie and you're a scientist, you might be like, that's like physically impossible. There's no way that could happen. That might detract from your enjoyment of the film. I know there's a scene in 2001 where the astronaut is stuck outside in space and he's trying to get back on the spaceship and he's locked outside and he has to shut the door and then open the other one real quick. And the scenes, there's this really loud explosion. And apparently that, that day they filmed it the, and cut it and edited it, they didn't have their scientific advisor. And he came back and saw it was like, there'd be no sound, there'd be no noise. I still think it's a fine movie with that, you know, but I'm not a scientist and I, I didn't notice it. But I'm sure if, if you were, that would detract from your uh, enjoyment of the film. Okay, so here we are finally at the end, and I told you this was coming. This is the end of the slide. Well, we got one more slide, but the, the, the last slide's more just like questions for comments and, uh, you know, uh, hopefully maybe some uh, discussion starters. Uh, but this is the last thing. In, in, in the last part of the reading, he starts to make a case uh, for why he thinks tragedy is a higher art form than epic poetry. So reading Homer and reading Hesiod, although those are good poets, is nothing compared to the art of Euripides, the art of Sophocles and Aeschylus, like the tragic poets. Why? Why is it better? Um, I'm just going to list these out. I don't want to spend too much time on this because we've already, I think we've spent enough time on Aristotle, to be honest with you. I'm starting to get exhausted. Uh, I can only imagine how you feel right now. Uh, so I'm just going to read these real quick and, you know, just, you know, if you, if you have any objections, you know, you chime on in. But here's why he thinks tragedy is better or higher, a higher art form than epic poetry. He says, well, one, it has everything that epic has. It includes everything, and it also has a chorus. So it's got everything plus. It's like epic plus. Uh, two, it's effective whether read or performed. Aristotle doesn't seem to think that Homer is going to be that effective unless you actually see it performed by a Homeric bard. you got to see someone performing those stories and, and reenacting them. But if you just read a tragedy, you just read the story of, of Oedipus, you're gonna you're gonna be affected by it. Um, the tragedy requires less space to attain its end, so it's more concentrated. The epic is, takes a lot longer to affect it. There's less unity in the imitation of the epic poets because it's longer. There's less unity of the plot. There's too many things going on. Kind of ties into what he said earlier about magnitude. So for him, tragedy is better at attaining the goal, its effect, the telos, uh, and therefore uh, for him. It's a higher form of art. So really, you know, for me, the, the big question I have for Aristotle, uh, you know, is does art always have to follow this formula? That, that's my big beef with him. I'm a huge fan of Aristotle. I, I, I really like him as a philosopher, I got to say. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to art, I think in a way, especially this idea of uh, uh, the last question here, right, this idea of a golden mean, I have, I have issues with that. To me, maybe that's just my taste. I like art that is kind of extreme, that pushes the edges, that pushes the boundaries. And I don't think there's much room for that in Aristotle. 
also this idea that there's even a hierarchy in art. I, I mentioned my, my, my reservations about that. You know, I'm a big music fan. You know, I guess maybe music's my favorite, maybe. It's hard for me to say though. I love film, I love visual art. So it's, and for me to say that one is better than another, um, I suppose if you're looking at art with a goal in mind, and you're trying to figure out which of these art forms is better at achieving its goal, maybe you could find an objective answer to that. I don't know, maybe you could, but it, I think it would take a lot of research. Um, you know, and do, does art necessarily have to have a goal or an aim? Can't you just make art that's just cool? I guess that would be the aim. That, that would be the aim, so just to look good, purely aesthetics. Although he doesn't seem to have an idea of art for that. Um, and, and again, I mentioned how I thought his approach to plot structure is a bit formulaic, right? He seems to maintain that there are all these, you know, rules for, for, for art that, that maybe there aren't, you know, maybe, maybe there aren't these rough and ready rules uh, for art. Okay, so I don't know why, but for some reason when I'm doing my, um, when I'm doing my PowerPoint, it's almost impossible for me to see the chat box. Uh, so it looks like, okay, nothing really, nobody really put anything in the chat box. Um, but we've got about maybe like five, 10 minutes uh, to go here uh, that I, I wanna talk a little bit about David Hume. Uh, but let's pause just for a second. For one, I need to get a sip of water. But let me, let me answer any questions that anybody might have about the paper, you know, if anything's popped up or um, about Aristotle. Any, any points of clarification, anything, anything that was confusing that needs to be gone over again? I'm not getting anything, doesn't look like it. All right, well, all right, well, I'm not gonna say too much about David Hume because to be honest with you, I'm a bit exhausted right now. <laughs> I don't. I I I uh, spent all morning rearranging my office. Uh, it, everything was all in shambles, and I got up early to do that, and, and um, I'm totally beat. So now I'm really beat after all this lecturing. So I spent too much time on David Hume. In fact, I'm probably just going to cover the very first slide, or maybe the second. Uh, but just to introduce you, we're we're jumping ahead quite a bit in years. So. You know, David Hume, he lives between 1711 and he dies just in time uh, to miss the American Revolution. So, um, you know, dies in 1776. And he's considered by, you know, I've heard this said about him by many people. Uh, he's considered by many to be the most influential philosopher who ever wrote in the English language. Uh, you know, so if you were making a top 10 or a top five, He's probably, and certainly if you're making a top five, he's probably the only English speaking philosopher that would make the top five, most important, most influential. So he's a pretty big deal, which is, it's weird though, because he's not that well known outside of philosophy. All the other big names like Plato, Aristotle, uh, even Kant and Hegel, you know, people, people know a little bit, especially Plato and Aristotle, but if you're a philosophy major, you know who Hume is, or you will know who he is uh, pretty soon. Um, but he was never really respected during his own lifetime. This is the big irony. This is true of a lot of people in history, right? They were never really recognized for their achievements while they were alive. In fact, if you would have told him what I just said about him on his deathbed, he would have laughed in your face. He thought he kind of deserved that title, I don't know about greatest philosopher, most important of all time, but he, he thought he was pretty important. He thought that his, his treatise of human nature uh, deserved to change the history of philosophy. And, and ultimately it did, but when he printed it, he, he expected it to have this big reception and to shake things up. But according to his, his own account, he said it fell stillborn from the presses. So he wasn't really, uh, did receive uh, the accolades that he, thought he deserved. And so he turned to history. He still did a little philosophy, but had to make a living as a historian and, and had to wait for other philosophers to discover him and kind of help revive his reputation. 
But one of the big reasons I think he wasn't respected during his own time was he was thought of as an atheistic philosopher. He claimed to believe in God, but his philosophy was very skeptical and pretty much tore holes in a lot of arguments that were being thrown out for God's existence. And he particularly attacked metaphysics and what he called natural religion. So natural religion was the practice of using philosophy and what was called science at the time to support your religious beliefs and religious ideas. And he was completely opposed to that, but that was the most popular thing going at the time. So you can maybe see why he wasn't well received. Uh, he had a big influence on the theories of Darwin as well. And so maybe if you take biology, I don't know, if you biology major and you read a little bit about Darwin, you might hear some of his influences they might mention Hume, uh, but he's he's a modern philosopher, I guess you could say. Uh, I'm going to put the the uh, the term modern philosophy in the uh, dialogue box because we've been looking at classical philosophy so far, classical or ancient uh, philosophy so far, and now we're in the modern period. So modern is a bit of a you might think it's a misnomer because you're thinking modern, 1776, it's not very modern, it's hundreds of years ago. Uh, but in philosophy, what we mean by modern is basically anything after the scientific revolution. So anything after, the, after you know, we discovered that the earth is not the center of the universe, the sun is the center of our solar system, the scientific revolution, the beginning of what became the age of enlightenment. Hume is smack dab in the middle of all of this, okay? So he's living after the scientific revolution. And um, although in this class we dealt with a lot of, you know, what you might call metaphysics, uh, so theories about the nature of reality, uh, Hume, one of Hume's major concerns uh, was not metaphysics, but rather what we call epistemology. Does anybody remember, I know we covered this on the very first day of class. Um, you might not remember what epistemology is. I hope you remember what uh, metaphysics is, but what's epistemology, anyone? I think it's, um, it's like the study of knowledge. Like Good. How right, like what is knowledge? How do you know what you know? Yeah, right on. So that's a big focus during the modern period. Some could argue that's, that's what characterizes modern philosophy and what makes it different from the classical Greek philosophy. The Greeks focused on metaphysics and they based all their other philosophies on their metaphysics. You know, for Aristotle, metaphysics was first philosophy. That's what he called it. They didn't have a word for it. It was first philosophy. So you start with how are things? Things are of this nature you know, they have a goal, they're aiming for this telos, and if you want to understand them, you want to under to know them, epistemology, you have to know the goal and the process and all that. So you start with the metaphysics, then you derive your epistemology from it. Well, when we get to the scientific revolution, things get a little bit complicated because all these things they assumed were just obviously true about the universe now turn out to be obviously false. They thought the world was, the earth was in the center. They thought that the earth was moving or not moving, that it was stationary and everything else was moving around it. And so, you know, you get philosophers like Rene Descartes who they start to think, well, what can I know? How, how can I know anything? All these great philosophers before me have totally, you know, they're brilliant and they're, they're geniuses, but they totally got it wrong. So how do I make sure that I don't get it wrong? So, you know, whether you're talking about people like Descartes or our man Hume here, a big focus is on epistemology. Now, David Hume, as an epistemologist, you would label him, you could call him uh, more or less an empiricist. He's one of the most famous empiricists, uh, one of the British empiricists. Let me write that out here, empiricism. Okay. So the name of his theory is empiricism. Okay. Someone like Descartes is going to argue for another view known as rationalism. So these are two competing epistemologies. These are two different theories of knowledge. Um, 
Ger uh, uh, Gerardo's asking, did he align with John Locke? Yes. John Locke is also an empiricist. Uh, there's John Locke. There's George, uh, uh, George uh, Barkley. Um, they're all empiricists. They're all a part of that same tradition. Descartes, Leibniz, Spinoza, they were rationalists. Okay, so what's the difference? What, what, what's a rationalist? What's an empiricist? Again, these are different theories of knowledge. Well, Descartes, he's the earlier philosopher. He's the one who says, I think, therefore I am. Maybe you know that, that famous quote, right? I think, therefore I am. Uh, for Descartes, knowledge is always based on reason. So that's the rationalists, right? Knowledge is based on reason, your ability to understand concepts and to use that understanding to make judgments and to draw conclusions. That's where knowledge is gained. Your ability to know is based on your ability to reason. David Hume says, no, 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 no. And John Locke as well, right? They're both empiricists. They're gonna say, your concepts, your ideas are all based on your experience. Right, all knowledge, therefore, is based on experience. So for David Hume, he's gonna argue that when it comes to experience, it's, it consists of these two things. You've got impressions on the one hand, and then thoughts or ideas on the other, right? Impressions, when he uses that term, he's talking about your actual sensations, your perceptions, uh, when you feel an emotion, um, things like that. And he says, these are more forceful. They have more vivacity, right? Uh, these are things that you can't ignore, right? They force themselves upon you. They're not voluntary, typically, right? Thoughts or ideas, he says, are, are merely perceptions of memory and the imagination. They mimic or copy our impressions, okay? So all of our impressions Everything that we can think about is always based on, a, you know, or sorry, all of our, sorry, I got it backwards. All of our thoughts, all of our ideas are based on some previous impression, you know? So for instance, all of us, unless maybe there's somebody in here who is colorblind, or maybe there's someone in here who is actually legally blind. Uh, my grandmother was blind, but she was blind. Uh, she uh, got blind later in life. Uh, but he says, if, if you're blind from birth and you've never seen any colors, you've never seen a color before, then you would never have an idea or a thought of that color. So you couldn't, you know, all of us could picture the color red. I, you know, I'm imagining, unless there are some blind people here, we can all close our eyes and just imagine a patch of red. But if we've never seen red, we wouldn't be able to do that. And this is true of all of our thoughts all of our impressions, all of our ideas, everything that we, we think can be traced back to some sensation, some perception. And it seems like we can think about whatever we want to, right? It seems like our, our you, know, you know, if you ask me, does our thought have a limit? It might seem like, no, I can imagine whatever you throw it at me, I'll imagine it. But he says, no, our thought is limited, just like the blind person can't see red in their head. They can't picture what red looks like. My thoughts are limited to my experiences, okay? So imagine, um, let's say you meet somebody who has never tasted an avocado before. Maybe there's somebody here. There's a lot of students here. Um, is there anybody in here who has never ever tasted an avocado? I guess everyone has, because no one's no one is 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 chiming in. Okay, well, if everyone's had one, then I'm imagining whether you like the taste or not, you know what it tastes like. You could imagine, oh yeah, avocado taste. Okay, yeah, I get it. I know what you're talking about. Okay, so Asim, uh, Asim has not had an avocado. He's never tried it, he or she. Sorry if I got your name wrong. Um, could someone explain to Asim what an avocado tastes like? Could you explain? It's a, it's a very earthy taste. Earthy? Yeah. I, I would agree, but... 
Yeah. Like imagine meat, but mushy and extremely bland. Ah. But a little salty. You're not supposed to eat it on its own. You have to you put it on like a chip to yeah. accompany it. I, I eat it straight, man. I, I know it's kind of like you, somebody says creamy in, in the comments, but I always think creamy is more of a texture than a flavor, you know? And, and if it's a flavor, it tastes expensive. <laughs> and I guess they are kind of expensive, avocados. But I still don't think, like, I guess I would agree with everything you just said, Hassan, but I still don't think that, like, if you've never had one before, I still, like, do you really think that anything we just said is going to help somebody understand what it tastes like? Somebody says nutty. I guess that kind of like same thing as earthy or similar. But yeah, like, I, I honestly think avocado is something that has its own flavor. It is very unique. It is very subtle. You said bland. I guess it is kind of. I like avocado, by the way, just so you know. But uh, it's something that, but once you taste it, you immediately have the, the thought or the idea. So he thinks this is the case. You can always trace your thoughts back to some impression. So what is this gonna do? How is this gonna uh, affect his, his aesthetics, his theory of art? Uh, okay, so here's where we'll, we'll end the class today, okay? For him, our standard of taste, that's the name of this essay, the standard of taste, um, how, you know, what's good, what's bad, this is always gonna be based on experience. He's gonna be a staunch empiricist on this. You know, that, that, that what we call good, bad, um, good taste, bad taste, whatever concept, beauty, ugliness, deformity, all these concepts can be traced back to some impression, to some sense impression, an emotion, or something we've seen, just like the flavor of avocado. You taste it, you apply, you apply the actual thing to your taste buds, and then your mind can remember it. It's not as vivid it's not as intense but just like you know if you've never felt love you can't watch a movie of somebody who's in love and really get it you know you can't really get what it's like uh, until you've actually fallen in love with somebody you know if you you never had your heart broken you don't know what that's like you know so but once you've had that or you never felt hate you know all these emotions direct experience is going to produce the concept, the idea. So this is true of anything, and it's certainly true of art. But things are going to get tricky, though, for David Hume, though, because he's going to deal with, um, we'll see this next time, and how does he deal with this? But he's, he, he seems to think that there are these two competing uh, viewpoints when it comes to our standards of taste. Um, it seems like there's these two competing viewpoints that both kind of make sense, they're very intuitive, but they're, they're competing. They, they both don't seem to fit together. They seem to contradict one another. They're not consistent. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and what are these views? What are you talking about? Well, on the one hand, we want to say to each his own. You know, what is it? Uh, uh, my mother used to say different strokes for different folks. I don't know where that comes from. Tennis or, you know, golf strokes, different strokes for different folks. You know, to each his own. Hey, you do you. If you like it, if, the, if you like the, the Justin Bieber, go rock out to Justin Bieber. You know, I'm going to go sit here and I'm going to listen to the Misfits, you know. It's just a matter, you know, my, my taste is my taste, your taste is your taste, and, and you can't really fault me for liking what I like, and you can't fault you for liking what you like. It's just up to your own personal thing. So there's that view, which he thinks is, 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 is totally legit. But then there's this other view that's like, but still, like, come on, isn't Beyonce, like, isn't she a better singer than that drunk dude over there slurring into the microphone at the karaoke night? I mean, isn't, like, aren't some things better than others? Like, I mean, sure, like, maybe I like cheap you know, Hershey's Kisses, but isn't that not as good as, like, the really fancy chocolate that you buy at, like, the fancy chocolate store? Um, so we, you know, he says, it seems like we've got these two competing positions and he's going to try to somehow resolve that, that apparent paradox. How can it be that we're all entitled to our own taste, but yet at the same time, there's obviously some things that are just better than others. So um, how's he going to do that? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but I guess that's all I got to say for this meeting. It's already, what, 235 
And uh, as I told you, uh, if you can't tell, I'm pretty exhausted. Uh, it's been a long week and I still have a lot of grading and rearranging to do. Oh, and my cat is now meowing at me. So that, I guess that's my cue uh, to go feed her. But you know, what? I'm going to, I'm going to stop the video recording.